whatever. So, Trevor, do you have the key for that door? I do, yeah. Do you it's need now it? closed and locked. Yeah, I think so. I think, well, I sure hope I do. <laughs> Did we lock somebody in there? Or something? Well, it's screaming well, ever since. <laughs> you can hear the moment of the song. Oh, I should silence all my jangles. Yes. I did. Okay, so I'll sit here then. Yeah. Protect the. Is it okay if we have the lights on like this? You guys should have turned down before. Just uh, butts with your YouTubing? No, it doesn't. I mean, it helps with the YouTubing because yeah. then Trevor won't be so dark. Oh, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Okay. Just the projector seems bright enough. Yeah, so we'll keep the ones at the front off and then it's okay. <clears throat> So much higher. But if you sit on the bank, there will be crinkles I, on the stream. What's up? Hold the game because of this solid. Yeah. Can yeah, yeah. put this in your bag real quick? Yeah, man. Go Just in it. case there. This. Yes. 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 That's like the oh, reserve yeah. thing, but if you... If you oh, I can like, sit wherever. You can sit wherever you want. You don't have to, like, crane your neck the whole time. I just have reserve seats. Oh, yeah, oh, I got a cool. <coughs> you said coffee in a very jo Jonathan way. Do, do we need uh, people of Canada as community members? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. You can sit on that side. <laughs> you want. Honestly, it's free for all sitting at this point. One committee member yeah. jump ship, so oh, man. It's all, it's all so many people. Uh, I Good thing we got the best. I mean, do, you guys wanna, <laughs> do you guys want to do the signing business now or after? Well, don't we need to see your talk? <laughs> <and> <laughs> <laughs> evaluate? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen in the next hour? Um, also, I tried to explain it. For all your thesis there. committee. Oh, it did still. Hi. Oh. I'm here. Did you, Nick, did you have a lot of time? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I know, right? You yeah, that was like the first thing I did. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. Those, those I don't want to be a scrub. Although, then we're going to lock anyone up. You departmental rep? I am, but I will let you guys lead right. the way. So, we have the whole committee here now, right? We do, yeah, actually. We do. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <I know>. What? <laughs> it's my fault. Who would have thought? The camera was going to show up right there on the I was the weak link. I don't think it's allowed. Yeah, I, I was your early. This is the most shocking part of this. It's the wrong place. Literally. But can we really start at one? I mean, the whole, the whole system. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's already 101. You can officially be late. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Well, here's a call from John Fisher. I better take it. What, is this the one where you're asking where we are? Um, no. Good <laughs> I know. Do we want to leave the door like slightly ajar just so people? Well, it is unlocked. Right? It's unlocked. Oh, it is. It's unlocked now. Okay. Yeah. I don't. Is there? An, and I believe there's a number on the outside that people can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, so it's my uh, privilege to introduce Trevor. He's uh, defending his PhD today. Um, and uh, he's been here for quite some time, did his master's from the Bible plant, right? Did his master's first. Um, and got uh, heavily into the Bayesian non-parametrics as part of the master's work, and then uh, decided to get even he more heavily into it uh, for a PhD. So, uh, going to give you some insights on the truncated Bayesian non-parametrics for his actual work. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with Trevor over the past couple of years and has worked very closely with many other people in the community, such as Tamara, Nick, and uh, John Fisher here, uh, for those that don't know them. Uh, so Trevor, uh, take the question. Well, thank you all for being here. I guess John's kind of introduced what I'm going to talk about to begin with, so I don't need to do that. But I will give you uh, a fair warning before we start. This talk might be just a little bit abstract. Uh, but I promise that, I mean, if you look at the title, there's some 
you know, pretty complicated words there. It might not mean a lot. Uh, I'm actually going to start with something much simpler. We're going to build everyone up from the ground level to where you know, sort of my PhD work kicks in. Um, so we'll start with data and modeling. Now, uh, you may not know this, but statistical models are kind of like everywhere. They're all over the place. Um, even, you know, sort of very familiar places like if you have a Netflix subscription, for instance, they're used to suggest movies to you. Um, some of like the very old applications, like predicting crop yields, and even some of the most new applications, like coming up with good predictive models for autonomously driving cars. And the list goes on and on and on of the applications with statistical models. Now, the neat thing about this is that actually, if I asked probably any one of you how statistical models were used in these contexts, you'd probably give me a pretty good intuitive answer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill out your intuition a little bit with some technical details here. So if they're very important, what is a statistical model? Uh, the way that I like to think about it is that it's sort of an imaginary procedure that's responsible for generating your data. So if you receive a data set, you know, in the real world, in, in whatever you know, uh, complicated process that, that generated your data, there's probably you know, little way that you're going to be able to describe that model mathematically. So what we have to do is come up with a way of describing it at sort of a much more simple uh, level. And this is sort of a conceptual procedure that we, we design as, as statisticians that we sort of in, in, our, in our imaginations think is responsible for generating the data. And that procedure has, it's usually got some kind of parameters, right, that determine its behavior. And our job is to use data to learn it. So we call that inference. You'll, you'll hear me say that word a bunch throughout the talk. Uh, that'll keep you here. Now, why do we need these? Well, what they really let us do is take sort of a, a fixed uh, data set and let us elevate it and ask sort of abstract high-level questions about it and get answers to those. So for instance, let's say I have a coin. You give me a coin, and I just toss it six times, right? I get some heads and some tails. Uh, and for the non-Canadians in the audience, that's labeled them for you. Uh, now, from the data directly, uh, we can really only answer simple questions here, like, you know, how many heads, how many tails? Whereas, was there a heads before a tail? You know, straightforward things like that. If we have a model, on the other hand, so let's say my model is that uh, each coin toss has sort of an independent probability theta of being heads. What we can do is we can do inference. We can estimate what theta is. So if I have four heads and two tails, I might think, OK, it is probably like two thirds, something like that. And now that we have this model, we can actually make predictions and, and answer abstract questions like, is this coin fair? That's probably something you're interested in. Or how likely am I to see heads next? Okay. Now, the next sort of chunk in the title that may not be familiar to people is the word Bayesian or, or Bayesian modeling. And this is actually a remarkably simple concept. It's just that the parameter, that theta, is random or unknown and your data is assumed to be fixed. I can actually swap that around and, and get a completely different paradigm, but I'm interested in the Bayesian paradigm because it lets us quantify the uncertainty that we have in our unknown parameter when we're doing learning. So for instance, if I have this example where I toss six coins, I'm probably not particularly certain that theta is two thirds, right? I should probably flip the coin a bunch more times to get more and more certain. And the Bayesian paradigm lets us sort of quantify that uncertainty. Now, the, the last piece is the word non-parametric, which is perhaps a misnomer. It could probably be infinitely parametric or infinite dimensional. Um, the reason why these things are useful or interesting is that in a lot of data modeling scenarios, there's more to learn as you obtain more data. Right? So if you have a model that's finite, and I'll explain kind of what these things mean in a second, eventually you're going to run out of space in your model. Your model is going to get saturated. So for example, if we look at our New York Times data set, right? Let's say that I want to learn the set of topics that's responsible for generating the, the, the documents that I read, right? So here's my, my data set, and I'm going to assume that I have a finite model so that my documents are generated according to a set of topics. Now, I'm going to say that our, our parameter data only has two topics, right? I'm going to assume that all of the New York Times ever has been generated by two topics, which is probably a pretty silly assumption. So there are my two topics, Psi 1 and Psi 2. And let's say, okay, I'm going to start reading some, some documents here. So like after 10 documents, I might have read all of them, and, and being oddly lucky, they are all about sports. Right? So I use my data to learn about the sports topic. And after I read 100 documents, I, get, I might get one more, so science. But you know, there aren't 100 documents ever written by the New York Times, so it's probably close to a million. I don't have a, you know, an actual number here, but that's a pretty good guess. 
And after a million documents, there's absolutely no way they are all about sports and science, right? There's going to be other topics like politics, food, etc. And actually, topics that we knew about are going to be refined. So sports, you might learn more about sports and find out, oh, we actually have different kinds of sports like hockey and baseball, and it might get refined further to basketball and football. So the non-parametric bit in the title, uh, you know, or, or in, in the models that I'm interested in, really refers to the fact that instead of you know psi one and psi two, we have psi one, psi two, psi three, all the way to infinity, and there's sort of always more space to learn more about your data. Okay, and that's it. Those are the basics. That, that gets everyone up to speed. A Bayesian non-parametric model is well, it's a model, so it's a tool that lets us answer and ask abstract questions about our data. It's Bayesian. So it lets us quantify our uncertainty and what we think we know. And it's non-parametric, so it has infinite capacity to keep learning. And I didn't pull those examples from before out of a hat. These are actually all examples of where Bayesian non-parametrics have been used before in practice. So they're relatively popular, and, and they seem to have some cool features. So you know, obviously, they've been researched pretty extensively. What, what is there left to do? Well, in my mind, there's kind of two big questions about Bayesian non-parametrics that need an answer. First, as I mentioned, we have this infinite model, right? Our world is finite, computers are finite, they have finite, <coughs> finite amounts of RAM and then processing power. So how do we represent and store an infinite model in a finite computer? Now the second question is uh, you know, not as obvious, I think. Um, as I mentioned before, the whole sort of notion of a non-parametric model is that there's sort of always more to learn, or, or if you need more to learn as there's more data, you should be using a non-parametric model. And the key phrase there is that you know, as you get more data, right? We're, we're thinking of data streams now, where there's sort of a never an end to the, what you can observe. And so if there's a data stream, we need to be able to you know, perform inference with streaming data. So the second question is how we deal with, with data in that setting. And we want to be distributed as well. We want to take our data and kind of process it on multiple computers because we want to do it quickly. Right? One computer may not have enough power to, to process all the data that we need to. OK, so past work on, on handling this infinite problem <clears throat> Probably the most popular option, at least uh, in, in recent years, has been to marginalize data. And the translation here is that what we're doing is we're sort of analytically with math averaging out the effect of our parameter. So just sort of pictorially, we have our parameter here, and we're just going to use math to, to kind of get rid of it. And what you'll notice is that I've added a whole bunch of different arrows in here. And those represent statistical dependencies that we've added by doing this. Right? There's no free lunch. We can't just get rid of this parameter for free. And so there's some good things and bad things about this technique. Right? It removes our parameter typically without any approximation involved. So that's nice. Right? Uh, we're still using the same model we had before. Uh, on the downside, because we now have this what's called a dense dependence graph, that makes efficient inference very, very hard. If I want to change what I know about one data point, I actually have to look at all the other data in my data set to do so. Now this technique is being you know, used to come up with marginal processes like the Chinese restaurant process and Indian buffet process, and it's been particularly useful to, for developing Gibbs sampling in this level. Now, you know, if one option is to get rid of beta, the other option is probably to keep it around, right? So we're going to call that conditioning on beta, and that has, you know, good sides and bad sides as well. Uh, because we have this infinite model, as I mentioned before, we can't actually use it or store it in a computer directly. So it requires some kind of approximation, right? Now, conditional independence, that we, when we put, that's what we get by keeping theta around, that makes inference easy. And what I mean by conditional independence is that there's only really arrows between theta and the data. There's no arrows that go between the data themselves. So that lets us take different chunks of data and kind of split it amongst multiple computers. And that's, you know, this sort of conditioning technique has been useful for variational inference. Now, as I, I said, this requires some kind of approximation. People like to use something called a truncated sequential representation for you know, approximating our infinite model. And without going into too much depth yet about what those things are, I, I just want to kind of highlight what we know about them. So on the left, we have a bunch of different Bayesian non-parametric models here. We have the Dirichlet process, the beta process, beta prime process, gamma process. And on the bottom, this is a model that's called a normalized completely random measure. And it is sort of a generalization of everything above. Right? So if I know something about this, I automatically know it for every uh, model above it. And you know, what are things that we would be interested in knowing about these models? Well, do we have a sequential representation? That's one thing that I'll be talking about. Do we know truncation error bounds? That's another thing. Uh, what do we know about the, the difficulty of simulating from these representations? 
And so the check mark here just kind of like how much of a check mark there is represents how much we know. I guess you know a good point to make here is that all of the results that we have in the past have been kind of put together by a, a very you know wide collection of different authors, each using sort of their own techniques. And what that means is that if somebody comes up with a new model and wants to do all these things with their new model, they have to start from scratch, right? So we have this sparse collection of kind of ad hoc results. Um, they're very cool, but there's no sort of general theory. And you know, you'll notice on the bottom row here, it's very, very empty for the most part. What we want is to, to fill in that row and get our general theory. OK, so you saw this slide before. You'll notice there's some white space here. You might suspect I'm about to put stuff there. Uh, you would be right. So first thing we're going to do is develop sequential representations and truncation error bounds uh, for normalized completely random measures. You can see that in CRM there. Now, on the second question, we have our, our streaming distributed inference problem. Uh, what I've done here is I've just put a bunch of algorithms along the left. These are sort of the state of the art in various ways. Um, and on the, along the columns, I have different properties that are sort of desirable of these algorithms. So can they handle truly streaming data? Can they handle distributed data? Are they asynchronous? Qualitatively, this is in my own experience. I've tried to be as nice here as possible. Are they fast? And are they exact? Do they you know, involve approximations? And you'll see that you know, there's some algorithms that are better, some are worse. These are all good in their own way. Um, the important thing to note here is if you look at the first three columns, there's no, there's no algorithm that has sort of three check marks along that first column. Right? That's sort of the basic requirement for dealing with Bayesian non parametrics. So there's no, it's, it's kind of odd, right? We have this model that's really useful for streaming distributed data, but we don't have any inference procedure that can really capture that behavior. Okay, once again, gonna fill in some white space. We have our second contribution of pieces, uh, which is the streaming distributed asynchronous inference algorithm. Okay, so uh, we're ready to jump into the first technical bit. This is on sequential representation and truncation. First thing I'm gonna talk about is a sort of set of tractable models in Bayesian non-parametrics. Uh, these are these like normalized completely random measures that I've been telling you about. Next, we're gonna talk about some sequential representations that we've developed, uh, all for that very general class of models. And finally, we're going to uh, figure out how to truncate them, how to, how to take that crazy infinite model and make it finite, and then analyze sort of what we've lost in that process. Okay, so let's jump right into the first bit. Now, the, in order to do this, I have to kind of introduce what the sort of standard state of the art model is in Bayesian non parametrics. And I'm going to do it by the example of the New York Times. So we have our data set here. We have our, our different documents in our data set, right? We have document one, two, three, four, and they're sort of going off to infinity. Each document has a collection of words, right? So the first document has 532 words, and those are split into a couple words about sports and a couple words about food, right? This is an odd document that happens to be both about sports and food. I don't know how one would do that, but. Uh, so there it is. Um, and along the top, we have the different topics that the documents can exhibit, right? And on the bottom, likewise, we have the corresponding popularities or frequencies of those topics in our data set, right? Now, the key thing here is that these, the topics, the frequencies, and how many words are assigned to each topic, they're all hidden from us. We don't get to see any of that. All we get are the raw documents and the words. So let's, let's you know, put together our model here. So we have our uh, our, our topics and our popularities or, or frequencies, and we're going to put those together and get our parameter data that we're interested in learning about. And then we're going to have these, these word to topic assignments that we also don't get to see, and we'll put them in, in some variables. We'll call those x1 to 4. And finally, we have the actual thing that we get to read or observe our documents, and those are along the bottom of that. Now, I've done this for the New York Times, right? But you can imagine this exact same setup for a completely different kind of data. So for instance, along the left, we can have like users in a social network, right? And, and, and we can have different sort of interests that they have up here. And we can have popularities of those interests at the bottom. And then in the table, we would have how much each user is interested in each potential interest. So we can actually generalize this, right? We can take our, our topics and our frequencies, and we can actually generalize them and call them traits and rates. So that's some terminology that I'm going to be using a lot. Right? And we can actually take our documents, of course, in a, in a social network data set. They're not documents, they're users. We're just going to call them observations. OK, so this is sort of the, the general setup of the model that we're you know, considering. And of course, you know, we're going to use our data here to learn about our, our uh, assignment variables and our uh, 
treatment rates. Now, I haven't totally finished this model yet. I haven't told you how the, the, the you know, hidden parameter theta is actually generated in this model. So the important thing to note when we're coming up with a model is sort of what desirable behavior we want, right? And that, that'll sort of inform us on how to make this model. So the big behavior here is that there isn't really an inherent ordering of traits, right? Sports is not before politics, is not before food, and, and, and you know, vice versa. So maybe the best way to think about that parameter is as just sort of a hodgepodge, uh, a bubble of, of uh, pairs of topics and their sort of frequencies. Now, if I'm going to be a little bit more concrete about this, I can actually think of these as points on a sort of two-dimensional space, right? On the x-axis, we have our traits, and on the y-axis, we have our rates, right? Each one of these is sort of a little, a little pair. And I can take each one of these points and sort of put them down on that space. And I can do it with all of them, actually. And if you remember, this is a non-parametric model. So we actually have an infinite number of those dots, but that would have taken me a long time to draw, so I didn't draw them. Um, now, if I draw lines down, I'm, I'm not really changing anything. I'm just taking these points and drawing lines down to the x-axis there. What I've constructed for you is something called a random discrete measure on the trait space. And, you know, the best way that I think to think about it without having any real background is think of it as kind of like a very spiky probability distribution over what traits each data point has. So what topics uh, each document might express. Right? Now, that's a general class of model. The specific one that we're going to be talking about is a normalized completely random measure. And it's parameterized, remember, the, you know, there's going to be parameters in that process. Uh, that has the parameter to do, it's, it's called the rate metric. It's not important to understand. The important thing here is that NCRMs, normalized completely random measures, generalize all of the popular priors that we care about in Bayesian non-parametrics. The Dierstein process, beta process, beta prime process, gamma process, and things that we haven't even developed yet. Right, so we have our infinite model. This is sort of the specification of it. Now I need some way to turn it into a finite approximation. So. Again, since we have these points on this space, there, there's sort of there's something called a countable number of them. There's different flavors of infinity. Countable is one flavor. Uh, and what it means is that we can actually put them in order. So we can say that point is 1, that one is 2, 3, 4, k, all the way up to infinity. And that what that does is that actually lets us write our parameter theta as this infinite sum from k equals 1 to infinity of frequencies located at points uh, at, the, at the traits side point. Now, I've told you we can do it. I haven't told you how to do it. So the question that I'm going to answer over the next couple slides is, how do we actually do that for NCRMs? Now, of course, I, have, I still have my infinite model here. I haven't made it finite yet. So the, I guess, most important part about working towards that is, for a finite data set, only finitely many traits and rates are actually going to be used at all. Right? If I have my New York Times document uh, data set. If I have finitely many documents, it can only possibly express finitely many topics, right? There's only a finite amount of information there. And what that means is that we can kind of get rid of the traits and rates beyond some level k without actually changing anything. To us, it looks like we used our infinite model, right? So I can, you know, grab sort of the lowest popularity traits and, and, and you know, look at that infinity on the, on the sum and sort of just throw them out and now I'm left with this finite sum. Right? That model's finite. Now we can put that in the computer. But I told you we can do it. I haven't told you how to do it. So how do we pick K? Right? We don't get to observe the topics and, and their frequencies. We just get this raw data. So we don't actually know which topics or how many topics were used. We kind of have to figure that out. So when we pick K, we have to do it sort of before we know how many K or what value of K we should really be using. Right? It's kind of a tricky question. So let's start with with moving on towards the, the actual contributions, our sequential representations that we came up with. So I'm just going to list them out here and kind of give you a, a, a little flavor for, for what they or how they work. The first one is called the deterministic representation, and it samples a deterministic number of atoms in every round, so every value of k gives you one atom, right? And an atom is one of those spikes in that distribution. So what it looks like, it's kind of like that, pretty straightforward. You have your atoms labeled 1 through k, they go off to infinity, you chop it off at some point, right? and then you just take those, those spikes and you just kind of throw them on your trait space, however you like. And you've seen this picture before, it looks exactly like this. We just have our one outer sum, and at every index we just generate one pair. Now, <clears throat> the important thing here is that 
I just you know, told you about this weird sequential way of sampling this thing. I haven't actually told you what it is. We've shown in the work that it has the distribution that we want. It gives you this NCRF that we're looking for. So we can do this you know, in a couple different ways. Another way is something called the fixed representation. And that actually samples a random number of atoms every round, in particular a Poisson distribution with a fixed beam. So what that looks like is something like this, right? Instead of getting one spike every round, we get a random number of spikes. We have three, four, uh, three again, I suppose. And we just kind of stick them together to make our random discrete measure. Now, that looks a little bit different. We have two sums now. We have our outer sum, those are the rounds that we're sampling over. And then we have, within each round, a plus sum number of atoms. And once again, we have this result that we're looking for. Sampling from that representation gives you the distribution that you want. And you know, if there's one that, that tells you that you have one atom every round and one that's random with a fixed mean, maybe we can go one step further and say it's random with a varying mean. And we call that the, the varying representation. And again, that samples a varying mean plus some number of atoms each round. So now it looks even a little bit more different than the last time. Instead of having just one sequence of plus on variables, we kind of have this array of them, right? And each one we have some random number of spikes that we generate, and then we just stick them all together, and that gives us our our random discrete measure again. And that looks even a little bit different than the last one, right? We have our two outer sums over the different directions of the array, and on the inner sum, that's our plus on number in each element. And once again, you know, uh, we have that, that distribution, uh, or that, that sequence of distribution generates a parameter that comes from the class distributions that we want, or it, it generates that entire class. Now, I should point out that this was not proven by uh, myself in this work. This was done earlier by Tamron, actually, who was on the committee. OK, so we have our three representations, right? We've ordered our atoms. We thought of a way of doing this in the general case. Now, the next thing to look at is you know, what happens when we do this truncation, when we cut that representation off. And in particular, I've given you three representations, right? You only asked, or, or I only told you to ask for one, uh, but I've given you three. So then the question is, well, now, how do I choose between them? Uh, the way that I would suggest doing that is by looking at something called the truncation error. And that really quantifies how close our finite approximation is to the infinite one. So you know, you can imagine we have these three representations. We simulate them all up to that finite level k. They're, they have different behaviors. They work differently. So which one got the closest to that infinite model at that level? And you know, the, the actual uh, mathematics behind this is, well, we're going to actually use the L1 norm between the marginal density of the data under the infinite model and the marginal density of the data under the finite model. Now, that's math. Pictures are usually better to describe things. So we have our model that we've seen before. It's got that full infinite parameter in it. And then we've got a duplicate of that model with the slight change that we're using that truncated approximation. And what we're doing is we're actually quantifying the difference between the distribution over the data in the infinite model and the finite model. Now, that has some behavior that's, that's probably worth discussing. Of course, because we're comparing distributions of data, it depends on how much data we have, right? And it also depends on the truncation level that we pick. Now, the idea here is that as we, you know, if we fix our truncation level, we say k is 10. As we get more data, we're going to start noticing that we didn't use an infinite model, right? Our data is going to be sampling traits. It's eventually going to fill up those 10 traits, and we're going to notice, wait a second, we're using a finite model here. So, as we get more data, our error between the finite and the infinite model is actually going to increase. On the flip side, as we, you know, let's say we fix our number of observations and we let our truncation level go off to infinity, that's, you know, the error should decrease, right? We're basically just getting closer and closer to our infinite model with our finite approximation. <clears throat> now, my job would be really easy if, if we could actually evaluate this exactly, but we can't. So we're going to find upper bound, which means that we're going to be conservative, right? Hopefully not too conservative. OK, so uh, this is kind of uh, the, the result in the work that leads to all the other truncation error results. Um, and it's actually fairly simple to describe. So we have the error right, that I was talking about before. We want this, ideally, we'd like this to be small. So what we can do is we can say, well, it's less than the probability that any data point in our data set selects a removed trait. Right? So, uh, 
So, so you know, of course, as you get more observations, there's more chances for a data to be like, hey, I want, I want trade 20 when you set k to 10. And then you're gonna notice, oh, I made a mistake, like I it's too small for the approximation. Right? And you know, if that, uh, that made sense, you can just think of the probability that we made a mistake. So from that, you know, what I affectionately call a proto-bound, we get truncation error bounds for all of these representations that we developed, uh, all of our sequential representations. So we have it for the D representation, we have it for the F representation, we have it for the V representation. And the important point here is that all of these bounds depend on N and K as you might call. They all increase to one as N goes to infinity, which is the maximum value of this error. All decrease to zero as K goes to infinity, which again, is what we wanted. And otherwise they have completely different, distinct characters. They, they behave quite differently. We actually do the exact same thing for the normalized, so that bracketed n in NCRM, we're covering that, uh, that case now. And we do the exact same thing. We get bounds for the D representation, the F representation, and the V representation. And once again, they all depend on n and k, the number of observations that are truncation level. They all have the behavior that we want. They increase to one with n, and they decrease to zero with k. And otherwise, they behave differently. Okay, so if they behave differently, then perhaps you know we should be able to pick one that's the best. Uh, but we can't actually do that. They're actually all useful in different circumstances. That's why I'm even telling you about all three today, right? And you know they have different properties in, in sort of different respects. So what I've done here is I've, I've put the three representations along the columns, and I have different properties. So how quickly does that error bound decay? How efficient is the representation? How easy are they to analyze theoretically? Do they capture that entire class of NCRNs? And finally, at every round, do they give you, this is just convenience, do they give you a known number of values? Now, of course, uh, uh, you know, some are better at some things, others are better at others. Uh, some important results here is that the DNF representations, uh, they give you incredibly quick reduction in the error bound as you increase K, they're very efficient. On the flip side, the V representation is a little bit slower, it's polynomial. Uh, in contrast, the F and the V representations are very, very easy to analyze because of that decoupling of the spikes, right? We're getting a plus on number every round. Somehow that makes them easier to, to treat mathematically. And the V representation captures all normalized completely random measures, whichever ones you want. The D and the F representation, there are some minor limitations there. And of course, as I mentioned, the D representation gives us exactly one atom every round. That can be convenient when you're designing inference algorithms using these. Whereas the F and the V representation give you a random number of values. Okay, so we have our three sequential representations, we have our three truncation error bounds. I'm going to put the icing on the cake here and talk about hyperpriors. Um, so the idea of a hyperprior is we have our typical usual model here. We're actually going to add a, just one more level of randomness, right? And, and what that gives you in your model is a little bit more flexibility. Um, you know, perhaps can make you a little bit more conservative sometimes, but it lets your model figure out more for you. So how does this affect the truncation error, right? This is a popular practice people use all the time. As it turns out, it's about as easy as one could possibly hope. You take whatever error bound I gave you before in those past couple slides, and then you just take the average of that bound over the randomness in these parameters that you've added. That's all that happens here. So, so you know, uh, when you boil it down, what this really means is that going from a model with no hyperparameters to a model with hyperparameters that are random is Okay, so that is all for the first contribution of the thesis. And you'll remember this table that I put up earlier. This is like everyone's favorite slide to show in a presentation. All right, so I'll tell you now that the check mark, now that you know what DF and B representations are, the check mark is, it stands for that we know all these things for all three representations, right? And what this work has done is really filled out that bottom row. It says, okay, we know about sequential representation. We know about truncation error bounds. I haven't told you about this. It's in the thesis. We know about the computational complexity of these different representations. And as I mentioned before, because that's the most general row, that gives you these other items completely for free. Right? So that's rather nice. Now, just to sort of summarize that first contribution, um, these, these things that we've developed give us theoretical tools for analyzing new priors that people haven't developed yet in Bayesian non-parametrics. Uh, they help automate the creation of approximations. So uh, something that's becoming more and more popular is probabilistic programming, where uh, you, know, you kind of have a 
coding language for statistics. And these truncation error bounds kind of guide us and tell us how to set that truncation level, which means that the user doesn't have to do it. And that increases automation, it increases ease of use. And of course, they also pave the way for new inference algorithms that use truncation, in particular, the streaming distributed uh, algorithms that I mentioned before, which rely on conditioning so that you can split up your data set. Okay, so we're done with that contribution. We're going to move on to the work on streaming distributed asynchronous inference. So, once again, we're going to do a little roadmap here. First, I will introduce to you the, the reason why this is a hard problem, and it's sort of a, a combinatorial hay, is what I like to refer to it as. And then I'll tell you how I solved that problem uh, with a couple of different techniques and sequence. And finally, we'll go over some uh, experimental results that show why this is you know, useful to humans. Okay, let's get started here. Now, just to bring us back from the world of theory into the world of things that are a little bit more tangible, recall that we want to use our data to learn about our traits, our rates, and our unknown assignments. And the way that people typically do this, this is sort of the standard paradigm, is that you just, you kind of know this blob of data, right? It's just a fixed data set. Each data point expresses some of the traits that you're worried about. You kind of crank it through your learning algorithm, and you're left with the traits that you've discovered. So in this case, we have our, our blue triangle, our purple star, our green circle, and, and red diamond. An important note here is that, okay, so you know, we're going to use some kind of approximation to do this to make it tractable you know, with a real computer. Uh, so the approximation that we're using is that sequential or truncated sequential representation that we've developed. And that actually has no problem here, right? Whether I label uh, uh, this red diamond four or one or move this blue triangle over a bit, it doesn't matter. You can actually just throw away those numbers after you're done. Okay? You're interested in learning what the traits are. The, the order that we put is kind of a crunch. It's just a representation. But here's the downside of that, as I, I guess I've hinted to before. If you think hard enough about all these data sets, none of them are, are strictly speaking, matches, right? If, if I wanted to go learn more about uh, what movies people like, I could always just go back to Netflix and just grab more data. There's always more movies being made, there's more people joining Netflix, there's more reviews being done. There's always, always more data to get. Now, that being said, people curate data sets into batches because it's convenient, because people do it this way, right? But I would actually argue that these are all streams and they're better treated as streams if you want to sort of fully exploit the information that they're building. Okay, so here's a framework that I'm going to propose. And, and I'm, I'm doing it to highlight the problem, but this is actually, this, this framework itself is almost one of the contributions. So. Okay, so what, what do we have here in our framework? We have our, our server that's kind of responsible for, for collecting all the results from all the different computation nodes. Uh, and it so far has learned about this blue triangle. It knows about the trait blue triangle. Some, some other computation node has told it about it previously. And we also have our stream of data. You can think of it just as a sequence of, of data points exhibiting these hidden traits. And we have our computation nodes. We have one here and one here. Now, each node in this framework is running an algorithm almost completely independently of everyone else, right? The only thing each node cares about is the data stream and the server. They don't actually even know about each other's presence. And that algorithm that they're running is that, well, first they grab a chunk of data, I'm gonna call that a mini match, off of the stream, and they talk to the server to see what the server knows about it. And once they've done that, they start thinking about the data, they start trying to learn whatever they can from it. And of course, the other node, completely unbeknownst to the first, does the exact same thing. Now, let's say, you know, this, this node here is a little bit faster, so it comes up with the traits that it learned quicker. It learned about the, the blue triangle, the purple star, and the green circle. And so it talks to the server to say, okay, I'm ready to update you with what I've learned from my mini batch. And it's fine, there's no problem, right? Nothing's changed, the server looks exactly as if no one had touched it before. Meanwhile, that slightly slower node finishes, and it discovers that it's got a problem. Uh, it talks to the server and it finds out, oh, hold on a second, you don't look like you did when I started, right? Things have changed. Somebody's added these two things and I don't even know what they are, right? And in particular, you can, you can see that the green circle here is actually in position two on this computer and it's position three on the server. So if I were to directly merge this model, uh, I would run into some pretty nasty problems. The thing here is that that trait order that we introduced in the first section 
it can be inconsistent across the computation of the network. Right? And actually, the problem is, is harder than what I've described here because we don't learn exactly what these traits are. We actually get a, a noisy, sort of messy version of them. And so it's not it's not as easy as it going, oh, okay, we have our trait here, that's a green circle, ah, no problem, I've got a green circle here. It's like, I have a blob, and I have a blob. I've got three blobs, you've got three blobs. They kind of look different, they kind of look similar. I don't know which is which. Now, that's the problem. Uh, I'd like to argue that that problem is actually huge. Um, you know, if I have K1 traits on the server and K2 traits on a computation mode, there are K1 plus K2 factorial over K1 factorial times K2 factorial possible matches, right? And to give you a sense of what that means, uh, if I, you know, let's just say I assume that the number of traits on the server and the computation mode are the same, and I type 5, 10, 20, 50, right? These are kind of like model sizes. And on the right, I've got how hard the problem is to solve, or the number of steps roughly it takes to solve that problem. So at 5, only 200, 252 steps. No big deal, right? The computer can, can crush that. But even if we only increase the model size to 50, we have approximately the number of grains of sand on a million planet Earths. Right? I can tell you how I came up with that number if you want. Uh, so needless to say, that is a hard problem, right? That's like a computer having to go on a million planet Earths and picking up every grain of sand and looking at it. Very, very hard. So the, the question is, how do we find that correct match? Right? And the big challenge here is that we actually have an unknown model size. I mean, this computation node has three traits. This server has three traits. But actually, we're going to make a model with four. Right, because we've noticed that, oh look, this red triangle is actually different. It's one that we haven't seen. Okay, so if the problem is big, the problem is hard, how do we solve it? The first step, and, and I'll apologize for the only slide of just gross math, uh, the first step is to figure out how do we even do this merging procedure from our computation node to the server. And I'm gonna break this down. On the left, what we're trying to get is our updated server model. So you can see we have our parameter theta here, we have our hidden uh, assignments x here, and we have our data set here, all the data we've observed so far. And it kind of breaks into three major pieces. We have the old server model, so when the computation node first grabs its chunk of data, it talks to the server and says, what do you know about current? Right? And then it goes off and thinks on its own. That gives us the mini-batch model. Right? So that incorporates the mini-batch of data that that computation node has grabbed. And finally, when it looks back at the server, it sees a new model, potentially, right? Things may have changed. And that factors kind of accounts for that. Now, something interesting, you'll note, if, uh, uh, if nothing has changed between the old and the current server model, these two factors will just cancel each other out, right? We have p, theta, x, whatever, divided by p, theta, x, whatever. If, they, if, if nothing's changed, that will just be one, right? It won't affect us. Okay, now there's also this little chunk that I haven't told you about. Uh, I'm going to call it the model size regularization, and I'll tell you how it comes into play in the slide. Now, something I haven't told you yet is that we can't actually do this, right? It turns out that every single one of these uh, terms in this decomposition incredibly hard. So what we do is we take our truncated uh, approximations that we've come up with, and we actually use them in the above decomposition. Because we can sort of learn with our approximations, we can't learn with our and that's what causes this ordering ambiguity, right? We, we've imposed this sequential ordering on our traits, and now different nodes might have done something slightly different. Now, so if we have that problem, how do we solve it? I'm going to do it by minimizing the KL divergence. That's just sort of a, think of it as like a difference between the exact model, that, that factorization that I showed you on the previous slide, and the approximate model with our truncated sequential representations put in. And I'm going to minimize that over all possible matches that we can look at of the traits. If you, uh, you know, drink some coffee and work for a little while, what you can notice is that that's actually a maximization over, again, the number of matches, uh, all the matches that we can try, of the sum of matched trait similarities. So, you know, I have a slightly red blob and the server has a slightly red blob. That's probably better matching those than matching my slightly red blob to the server's slightly blue blob, right? We want to put things together that look similar. We also have this thing, this model size regularization that pops up again. That forces us to kind of, it forces us to put components together when we're doing this matching, right? Because if I have a server with four components, or four traits, and a computation with four traits, we can just have an eight trait model, right? Just append them, no big deal. 
uh, and you know we're, we're doing a great job matching here, right? Because we haven't put anything that looks bad together. The problem is we don't want to do that. That's, that's not the right idea. We want to kind of shrink the model as much as we can. We want to force it to put traits together when it can. Mathematically, that's what these two pieces look like. We have our you know, double sum over the, the components or the traits on the computation node and the server. And we have our regularization here. Now, the important thing to note is that that first term is available in closed form. I can compute it in constant time. I can write it down for you. It's fairly straightforward to deal with. That term, on the other hand, I can't even evaluate it, let alone optimize it. That's, that's kind of the thorn in my side. So I'm going to deal with it somehow. Uh, as it turns out, you can use Jensen's, Jensen's inequality uh, to get a lower bound on your regularization cost or, or score. And we're actually going to optimize that instead. That's a pretty standard you know, trick in the literature. Now, the first nice thing about this lower bound is that it's available in closed form for the priors and Bayesian non-parametrics that we're interested in. And I'm going to do a little plot here. Um, what I'm trying to show. Uh, well, let me just describe it to start. On the right, on the y-axis, we have our values of our regularization, so that's that really complicated term that I can't deal with. And on the x-axis, these are just different sort of characteristics of the data set that we're playing with. And these different lines represent different parameters that I'm using for the NCRM that I'm working with. So really what this plot is just showing is that for a wide variety of circumstances, if you look at the solid line, which is the, I, I brute force computed the regularizations of my computer. It took a really long time. If you compare those solid lines for all the different parameterizations and all the different uh, data set types, if you compare that to the dashed line, which is the lower bound that I can compute in basically constant time, you'll see that they, they're incredibly close to each other. Uh, the lower bound that I propose is a very, very good approximation of the original regularization. So ideally, if we use this in our optimization, it should do something similar to what the original cost function would have done. And if you remember that table that I showed you earlier, uh, you'll see that what we've done by using this lower bound uh, is we've reduced our optimization to something called a linear program. Uh, or for those of you who know this, is a bipartite matching, right? And what we know is that those are way easier to solve, right? For instance, if I get up to model size 50, I have about something like 125,000 steps to solve that problem. And a computer can knock that out very, very quickly. Uh, for the computer scientists in the audience, that optimization, now that we're using this lower bound, it has a complexity of KQ, so it's quite tractable. OK, so we're back to our framework using the things that we've developed. Uh, we're just going to run through the algorithm again. But first, I'll tell you that that framework that I've developed, I'm going to call it SDABNP, and that stands for Streaming Distributed Asynchronous Vision on Parameter. Mm -hmm. So we have our computation node. They, they talk to the server. They grab their mini batch. This guy does the same thing. They're thinking about their data. They're doing inference. One guy comes up with a model first, uh, a little bit faster, talks to the server. Nothing's changed. We can just remember that those two terms, they cancel out. Everything's nice. We don't even have to solve a matching problem. We just push it to the server. Now, we run into the problem again, where the, the second node finishes, notices there's something wrong here. But it's not an issue. We have that trait matching now. We have that optimization. So he solves it first, and then pushes the model to the server, and away we go. We're done. And then, of course, these guys then grab other data batches that are further along in the stream, and other computation nodes are doing this as well. Right. So that is the entire inference framework that I've developed. Let's talk about some experiments that show that it's actually worth using. Right. So here's the, the data and setup that we have. We're using a 2D synthetic Gaussian mixture with 100 clusters. So our data set looks something like this mess. right? It's just a bunch of points in 2D. Our model that we're going to use to capture the sort of latent structure is called a, a Dirichlet process Gaussian mixture. And you'll know that this Dirichlet process piece, that's a normalized completely random measure. That's an NCR. Our actual hardware setup, uh, we had a 24 core Intel i7, 128 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, we never got anywhere near that, which is great. Uh, did everything in C++, and our job with this data set is to capture the number of clusters or, or even just find the clusters in data. And so you can see over here, this is kind of what we'd like to, to do. We'd like to split our data into green, red, and blue, and maybe even some other colors. Now, the algorithms that we compare to, uh, they're called 
but they're, they're basically the ones that I listed before in that table. Uh, variational Bayes, sequential variational approximation, stochastic variational inference, MOI is online variational Bayes. You see the word variational popping up here a lot. Uh, this last algorithm is the only non-variational algorithm. Uh, it, it's the one that has that check mark in the exact column. So that's the one algorithm that I'm comparing to that doesn't sacrifice anything by making approximation. Right, so this is everyone's favorite plot. Uh, this is actually, I find this the most boring plot, but I'm gonna describe it anyway. Um, we have our different algorithms in different colors here. We have a, a trace of, as the algorithm was sort of chugging along the data, we have on the y-axis how good the model became, so higher is better here. And of course, on the x-axis, we have our time, so you wanna be further to the left. That means your algorithm is faster. And what you'll see is, well, we're the blue line there, so, uh, you know, we kind of hit peak model quality roughly two orders of magnitude before the next best competitor. And, you know, there were faster algorithms, but they, they did not perform very well. And this, I actually, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, I think this is the most interesting plot. So what we did here is we compared what happens with our inference framework when you sort of hamstring, you, you turn off trait matching. So you just ignore the problem and you just smash models together. Will you? So on the left, uh, you know what, I'm gonna do the axis first. So, we have the number of threads on both of these. These have the same axes. Uh, so, these are sort of increasing the number of computation nodes. And we have two y-axes for the two different colors. So on the left, we have computation time. So these are the blue bars here. You want these to be low, right? You want to have a fast algorithm. And on the other y-axis, we have the model quality again. So higher is better, right? And those are those green boxes. And we have the exact same setup over here, except now we've enabled trait matching again. And the big point to take away here is that without trait matching, you know, as you increase the number of computation nodes, there's going to be more conflicts. There's going to be more arguments about what trait ordering is the right one to use, and the model is going to suffer as you get more computation nodes. Now, on the flip side, if you enable that trait matching, you take care of the problem somewhat intelligently, you notice that the model doesn't suffer at all as you increase the number of threads. And meanwhile, the computation time still decreases very significantly very similar to without trait Now, one might wonder, you know, okay, I told you it was k cubed complexity, but what does that really mean in practice? Well, it turns out that the time it took to solve those matching optimizations uh, was fairly small. On the uh, x-axis here, we have the merge time in microseconds, so that's, you know, potentially negative six seconds. And, you know, if you add up all of these bars, it essentially took six milliseconds for the entire all, all the matching problems that we solved in the entire inference task. Meanwhile, the overall inference procedure took 100 milliseconds, roughly. So the matching time is about 6% of the overall inference time, which is fairly insignificant. What was K here? K was 100. K was 100 for the full data set, the true K. Of course, for the, for the mini-batch nodes, or the computation nodes, they picked, I believe, 20 each time. So they only saw a small subset of the data. They only saw a small subset of the data. Trips, the conclusion there is one option would be uh, at all, wait till the central unit sends you the model and then start doing inference on the new data. You could but, have but done that. But yeah. what you're saying is that's going to be much slower if you start when you get the new model than just doing the matching. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you're better off solving the matching than waiting. Trevor, can I ask you a question about the sure. previous slide? Yeah. Um, uh oh. <laughs> so, I would have expected the results to be identical for the threat number of threads being equal to one, because it should be the same. Thing. Yeah. It looks like the so, side, the, CD, yeah. the um, or the, the, the little that's like the head is a little lower. Yeah. Oh, we know. Yeah. Sorry. The model quality is a little bit lower. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't actually have a particularly good answer for you on that immediately, I'll have to think about that, because this, this work was done a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, I, no, I completely agree with you. They should be the same. Um, yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have a good answer. It could, honestly, you know what it could have been? Um, there is some stochastic, stochasticity in the inference algorithms themselves, and I just may not have taken enough samples to, to push those error bars uh, down enough. I mean, you can see that they're, they're somewhat large there. So. Yeah, what, are, what are the error bars over here? They are over, so this is you know, a sort of standard box plot. So the line in the middle is the median, and then we have the 
25th and 75th. But it's like you ran the algorithm some number of times? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you happen to remember what that number was? I believe it might have been 100. Oh, okay. That seems like a number I would have picked, but I, I, I can't tell you. I, so. I'd be surprised that, that you wouldn't have narrowed down on the actual median after yeah. 100. You know, I, I, I'm not going to put my stake in the ground here. Okay, I think sure. I have to think about yeah, that. Yeah. Threads per batch? Or yeah. No, that's just total number of threads running. Right, so we would expect the first two to be almost the same. We would, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, for sure. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. I know at one point I had an answer for this. I just can't bring it up right now. So I'll have to get back to that. Okay, but so sure. moving. What, mind if I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So okay, when you say CPU time, is it for sure. thread? Is it that is overall? So that's the entire time it took to do inference with that number of threads for that data set. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so where are we? We're here. So the last interesting plot that I have is that it turns out that because you discover fewer traits over time in your data set, um, the number of matching problems that you actually have to solve over time also decreases, right? The nodes start to agree on a particular ordering, and then they all eventually just start contributing to that order. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the, the number of matchings that we solve as we merge more mini batches kind of tapers off along with the number of clusters that we discover. So that's kind of a, a nice feature, right? Our algorithm doesn't slow down over time, it actually speeds up to some extent. OK, and I believe that's it for that contribution. Um, once again, we have our, our lovely table with check marks. You'll notice that I've added a row to the bottom, which is the algorithm that I proposed. and as you might suspect, I've put some check marks in the table where I, I asked for them earlier. So this algorithm is streaming distributed asynchronous, qualitatively very, very fast. And of course, it's not exact. Um, if you could put a check mark there, that would be like if there was a Nobel Prize in statistics, that's what it would be. <laughs> so I, I did not want to do that for my PhD. <laughs> OK. So the framework that we developed, uh, of course, as I said a uh, hundred times now, it's streaming distributed and asynchronous. Something I haven't mentioned yet is something called a learning rate. And this algorithm doesn't require a learning rate, so there's less to two. Some of the other popular algorithms, you have to pick this sequence of steps, and it's completely up to you what you pick. And it can actually have a very strong effect on the quality of your inference. So because we don't require one of these things, that's actually a, a pretty big plus. Something I'm going to tell you that's confusing, it's truncation free. So I've been telling you this entire time about truncations, right? Because we have this matching optimization, it can automatically sort of expand the model as it needs to, uh, as, as we you know, observe our traits. And so even though we're using this truncated approximation, we can actually re you know, retrieve our truncation-free uh, inference from this algorithm. Uh, it only requires a black box inference algorithm to run. So if you give me a better inference algorithm, uh, theoretically, I will do better. What if and I have something that's not a variational inference algorithm? So this works only for variational inference. And right? why is that? Yeah. It requires. Uh, something called a probability density to be able to do that multiplication. So, but what if, what if I had an algorithm that gave you a density approximation, like a full density approximation, not like, like it's not an empirical approximation like right. MCMC. Right, right, right. It's just not it's, BB, like maybe right. EP or something. It also depends on the particular form. So if you okay. have exponential family uh, uh, models of your traits, this will work. Does it, does it have to be exponential family marginals? Could it be like an exponential family over the it has to be It has to be uh, like fully decoupled. So okay, okay. Mean field okay gotcha. That's what this relies on. And the reason I did that is because most popular yeah, variational sure. inference. So I couldn't run MCMC, give you labels, um, do updates to the parameters, and then you do your matching. So this. Actually, that's ongoing work. I'm working with a student at Berkeley right now on that. Yeah, because I was about to say you could presumably do Max's stuff, but I assume that's the student so at Berkeley. That's so, exactly yeah. the student okay. at Berkeley, yeah. So you can, you can do similar things to what Max Rabinovich at Berkeley is doing. And you just kind of take his idea and my idea and stick them together. It seems to work for some model. So it's like a VB approximation to an MCMC thing, and then you put that in. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK. And finally, this works well in real data. Uh, I don't have time to talk much about it, but uh, I collected some uh, ADSB aircraft trajectories and cluster them and get some pretty looking results here. And you know, of course, the MNIST and Sun Images data set, we just cluster different handwritten digits and uh, different images. It does reasonably well. It does about as well as you'd hope it would. Um, and so I figured I would present the synthetic results because they give you sort of more of an intuition for what's going on under the hood. OK, so that, that's it for me. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a thought here. Uh, before, we had 
models that could kind of, in, in a sense, learn forever, right? They have this infinite capacity to keep learning more as you get more data. But we didn't have an inference algorithm that could exploit that capability. All the inference algorithms were for batch data. What I've kind of done here is given us a principled way when by principled I mean those truncation error bounds with, with uh, you know, detailed math behind them, of creating approximate inference algorithms, so the inference framework that I developed, that can learn forever, and they don't grind to a halt, that in particular they actually speed up. So, that is all. I have to, of course, thank a whole bunch of people here. Um, first of all, John, my supervisor, uh, you know, none of this, absolutely none of this would have been possible without him. Uh, he's been very supportive and, and uh, helpful over the years. My lovely committee, who are all sitting, well, I guess they're a little bit split up, but they're all over there somewhere. Uh, Tamara, John, and Nick, um, they kept me on the best path, despite my constant efforts to stray off of it. Uh, I have to thank the Office of Naval Research for my funding. They paid for my coffee, so they paid for my research. Uh, and of course, my co-authors, uh, the lovely Julian Stroud, who is not here, he's on the West Coast, but you'll see his name appearing in some of my papers. Uh, Jonathan, who is here, in the back somewhere, um, was a co-first author on the work on, on truncated random measures. And of course, Luke, uh, well, we didn't write any papers together, but he, uh, he kept me sane and kept me healthy, so I have to thank him for that. And everyone else, a lot of you who are here, uh, thank you so much. That's it for me. I'd be happy to take questions. Who are your readers? Uh, Taposh was over here, and Jason was over there. And Jason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this thing just literally died right now. <laughs> Good time. Yeah. So I'm gonna awkwardly like sit here with my slide. <laughs> <laughs> so Trevor, yes. Uh, so we have these L1 uh, bounds on L1 error, which are three different things. Yes. <laughs> and, and you derive them for uh, MCRM, so it's much more general. But if you just, for example, take a DP. In your analysis, you specifically truncate at some K mm -hmm. and then derive this error. Would it change the bound at all or the rate at all if um, you truncated at K, but let's say you maintain this one, one more term, which is the base measure? I see. And through everything, you know, through things that were not likely under the existing atoms into that. Does that I mean, matter at all or no? Uh, I, I mean, it doesn't matter for you the math. You understand what I'm asking? It doesn't, well, it doesn't matter for the mathematical analysis, but people actually have used that idea when designing inference algorithms, right? They, they say, okay, we're going to truncate. It's a set of all atoms I haven't seen. And yet. then we're going to collapse all the atoms into one at the okay. end. And so that's exactly what people have but been doing. But you don't doing. think that won't enter the... It doesn't, as far as I, you know, on the top of my head, I don't think that would change things that much. I mean, you'd have to... You have to modify the math a bit to account for that last atom that's going to be different from all the other ones because right. you're not strictly just cutting it. Um, but yeah, I don't suspect it would change things too much. So then the good news would be you could do that and still use your bounds. Ideally, yeah. How general is BNP in the second part? How general is BNP? Oh, so, okay. so, you, so it's like, okay, now I have SDA BNP. Right, right, right. Like, is so, this for all CRMs and NCRMs? Yeah, so this, we did this specifically for a couple of models. We did it for the Dirichlet process, hierarchical Dirichlet process, and the beta process, which are sort of the, I guess, three most popular in practice. Um, the thing that would stop you from doing it in general is that you need these uh, exponential family mean field variational approximations. And those, I don't know if people know how to do that in general yet. Mm -hmm. So you know there might be have there might have to be some chunk of work that's done, but once you've done that, really the, I would say the big the big steps that we're taking here were that lower bound that we found on a lot of the priors um, and the decomposition, and those two things, those two ideas, still hold. You just need to modify them for whatever new thing you're considering. <coughs> Your error truncation analysis. Uh, you describe why you chose to use the L1 norm instead of. So we <laughs> we chose to use the L1 norm uh, because <laughs> authors before us had, and we wanted to sort of capture their work within one concise framework. You could use other error bounds for sure. Um, I think the L1 error without you know I don't want to say this exactly because it's hard to, to guess what would happen with math right, before even doing it. But I suspect that that would be the easiest distance to use. Look up Chef's theorem, and then you'll have a justification. What's, I actually don't know what Chef's theorem is. Chef's theorem uh, says that the, suppose I want to estimate the probability of some event 
under your approximation. Yeah. Whereas the true probability is what I would evaluate under the actual model. Um, Chef's theorem says that that error in those esti in my estimate is bounded by the other okay. error. Okay. All right. So I like I kind of knew that result, but I didn't know the name for it, which happens a lot. And is there any relationship between those three? I mean, you said that some of them have others in different cases. I mean, you said the three bounds. Is there an interrelationship that maybe you could say, or would you just sort of have to use all three and then so, figure out which is the tightest? So you wouldn't actually have to. I mean, the, the point of that, uh, I guess, theoretical analysis is that you wouldn't have to try all three. Like, you would start with whatever analysis or data modeling problem you had. You would look at the properties that each three has and say, ah, this one is going to be the best for me. Now, is there a deeper connection between them? I don't know. Um, my my suspicion is no, aside from the fact that they all are able to model a normalized completely random measure, simply because they they are generated in very distinct ways. When you see the properties though, is there like a table that says if you have these kinds of properties, you should use this bound? And uh, there is a table that conveys that information, not in, in such a digestible format, but it exists. Uh, can you make one for us? I can, if you'd like. <laughs> Perhaps not now, but. <laughs> that might be hard. <laughs> 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 I hesitate to ask you to go back, go back to the now hard disk. I can, I, there's like a little drop down menu that I can grab. Which slide do you want? Slide 19. Okay. Um, slide 19, let's see how you use it. Oh, yeah. These slides are exchangeable, so. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that might be a hard sell. All right. Uh, <laughs> So the new parameter there, uh, you, you talked about it, so don't worry about it, and then never said anything about it. Yes. Um, I, I, it doesn't, it's not critical to the understanding of the yeah. work, so I just kind of wobble over it. What it is, is it, it really determines, let's see if I can squeeze a bit more it's 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 Yeah, so it actually determines the distribution of the, like, where these points lie in this vertical axis. So, uh, you know, for instance, you can imagine uh, uh, one of these uh, discrete random measures that has a ton of tiny, 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 tiny little atoms that, you know, uh, their, their sort of position in the y-axis drops off very quickly. And others that don't, maybe they have like a polynomial decay or something different. So nu is what really controls that position in the y-axis. And this, I, I didn't even mention it because it wasn't worth it, but this other distribution controls the position in the x-axis. Is that a parameter that you have to pick then? I mean, how do you so that's, that's your model. So you come to the problem with that. Now, as, as a practitioner, you might come not come to the problem with new, but you know if you have a model that you're interested in using, uh, you know there are you know, tons of literature out there that tell you what new is for that model. So we started from that. From that standpoint. So if you have these two representations. How do they? This may be unfair uh, <laughs> because you know, S, the SDA base came first. It did. Yes. Uh, how did they inform that algorithm, if at all? Uh, Other than. I, Granted, you could analyze the performance, but I mean, in terms of deriving the yeah, yeah. first procedure. So the idea here, I mean, the way that I like to think about the connection between the two is that if I want to do streaming distributed inference for any particular model, the first thing I have to do is come up with a truncation approximation under my framework. At least. And so that, all this math in this first contribution informs you, you have this new model you want to do streaming distributed inference for, this tells you how to do the truncation. And then you can start from that truncation and then hopefully use similar techniques to what I developed to do the stream distributed inference. Can you give us slide 24? Sure. Uh, that's not that far. I'll just go through. I think it's 24. Just to clarify, if you're truncating based on streaming data, you haven't seen all the data, so I don't even know. So the truncations are something called a priori. So the truncations you have to do before you see any data. Uh, now, that's partially because if you want to design an inference procedure based on these truncations, you've got to start with your truncations. You can't wait until you've seen your data and thought about it and then use the truncation. There has been work on a posteriori truncations. Um, it's you know, not particularly useful as far as I can tell for specifically designing these procedures. It's useful for analyzing what happens in the, in the sort of posterior case. And it doesn't include the use of smooth likelihoods. So you have to, you know, in that three level model that I showed, you have to start with just two levels. You can't actually handle the third level. Like well, what does that mean for the streaming case then? But, because your premise But is that's not even the full story, right? I mean, if you have any of these models, like if you just use a Dirichlet process to start with, we know the asymptotic 
almost sure distribution of the number of atoms is a function of the number of right. data points, right? And so implicitly, it's not so crazy for this kind of thing that you would say, hey, I could have a truncation that depends on the number of data points that I might know a priori, because you're technically assuming it anyway, right? Yeah. No, but that's my question, so I, I agree. But you're talking about streaming data that can learn forever, so right. it's going to grow logarithmically in the DP case. Yeah, so especially if you're inferring hyperparameter, that's going to be true. Yeah, that's yeah, so you have to have some kind of hyperparameter inference for this even to be, like, I think... But then you of, don't know. You don't yeah. completely know a priori. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, you know, the, you know like, the rate, but you don't... You know the rate, know. but you don't know the constant. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But, but I guess I'm not saying that we shouldn't be skeptical. We should be, right? I mean, maybe we don't even know that rate, really. Yes. But it's, but it's built in at I mean, a deeper level rate, than... Maybe the rate doesn't even exist. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. We're yeah. not saying you have to solve this. I just <laughs> want to understand it. So yeah. I, I, I've been trying to understand this. Uh, this is... Is that the V? Or this is the V. Right? Yes, the V. Yeah. So, so if I start... Everything... Sorry, if I look at each of these uh, models as emanating from some underlying Poisson process... Yeah. Should I think of these as sort of mini batches over the same Poisson process? Is that? No, not quite. Okay, so the best way to think about the V representation is actually through the marginal processes. So like the Chinese restaurant process, the Indian buffet process. Yeah. The way that the V representation was developed was by looking at those processes, seeing which atoms get activated after every data point, and then that's where these get added in to the model. Right? And so, so for instance, for something that generalizes... Oh, uh, you're right. Okay. So for something that generalizes the Indian buffet process, some uh, traits might be expressed more than once, right? So you can imagine the number of times the trait gets expressed comes along this y-axis, and along the x-axis we have how many data points. Kind of something along those lines. And very, you know, 50,000 per year. That's what the view representation is. Sure, why are those two solutions? Oh yeah, so so the truncation occurs on the outer sum. Uh, that inner sum is actually a real thorn in the side for a lot of this work, because um, of course you can't simulate that inner infinity, right? Like you can truncate the other one, but your your hose you can try to simulate the inner one. So we've actually done some work to handle that exact problem, but that's in the thesis. I didn't want to go into that. But you're right, that's that is a problem. So, first of all, the thesis is very nice as we, as we talk. Um, the, the idea of streaming has, the streaming data has sort of forced me to think in sort of different weird ways. And one of the things I started to worry about is why do people like batch algorithms? I noticed that even your streaming algorithm is, has many batches, it right? So it is, batches, it, yeah. it, it, it is actually a batch algorithm. Right. Uh, it's batch, a batch sequential algorithm. It's a batch sequential algorithm. Yeah. So, one of the reasons people like batch algorithms is because if you get something wrong, you can go back and fix it. Again. And you can't. Cannot. So once once one of your little nodes has made a decision about the allocation of topics or something, the data's gone and it, and it gives up. Yeah. Um, I guess, is there a way, you'd actually like to have not not yes. have that happen. You'd like, you know, like you wouldn't want your New York Times understanding hour and they get surprised by football every September. Right. And then, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, well, that's gone. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny you hit on this, because that is, if you don't tune this algorithm right, that's what you can end up with. It's just it's constantly being surprised by things. Well, <laughs> so, uh, I guess, so I was, as I was reading the thesis, I was looking for, it, like, how to how to deal with that, yeah. and where's the tu where where is the tuning happening? Because I couldn't figure that out. Okay, so there's there's two questions. Uh, where is the tuning happening, and, and how do we solve to avoid the, that problem? Yeah. yeah. So um, the tuning actually happens at the individual mini batch inference level, right? So I said that they, these these computation nodes are each running yeah, their own. I want to make sure. For a second, for you, uh, the issue is not uh, uh, losing a topic, right? Because presumably football would have come up under some other node. Uh, Right, but John, if, if, if I set my parameters wrong, yeah. it might not match football to football. It might just keep them separate and keep learning football over and over and over again. Okay, all right. That right. seems like that's a problem. Well, it is. so <laughs> doesn't the trunk, but doesn't the trunk, if you, if football, the duty cycle in football is long enough that the truncation operation could cause you to forget, no? Uh, no, so the truncation operation only happens at the mini batch level. It never happens at the global algorithm level. Okay. At the global algorithm level, actually, this is a limitation of the algorithm. It only creates it doesn't ever reduce them. Yeah. And so actually, that was, one of the, 
that was one of the reviewers' complaints on that paper. Like, there's no way to correct mistakes that you've made when you've introduced like okay. merge, merge things. So, yeah. so, so, so the streaming off. So putting yourself in the streaming context then doesn't actually guarantee the growth without bound. Like the, the argument for streaming is you want to be able to represent arbitrary amounts, but actually at some point you're the arbitrary, even what you're representing is going to exceed your RAM. Uh, no, so the, the nice thing about, well, yeah, it will exceed your RAM. That's absolutely certain. But <laughs> let's say I had this like infinite stream of RAM. Yep. This algorithm would use that infinite stream of RAM, right? So it would keep adding more and more trades sure. as it needs to this code. Okay. So Trevor, when you say like you're doing like a 20, uh, 20 topic or whatever, or 20 um, thing, um, truncation, you're doing that at the sort of mini batch level. That means you're basically at each, each time it gets a mini batch, it can it can add up to yes, twenty exactly. topics or twenty yeah. clusters or whatever. So, so I'm it, limiting it in yeah. that way. So so. But if I'm here, like that's like a pretty reasonable thing that you can right. set. Like and, you can set that very generously. And these truncation bounds completely yeah. apply to that, right? Yeah, you can exactly. Say, if I grab mini batches of size two hundred and my truncation level is whatever twenty, I I have you know a probability of ten to the negative six of making a mistake. I'm okay with that, right? So that's that's actually partly where the truncation bounds come from. I see. So the problem. The problem is not that you would be surprised, but it would it wouldn't it wouldn't match properly, and so yeah. you'd end up with many copies of the exactly. Yeah, that's that's really where the problem is. Okay, and then the other thing that I was sort of uh, worried about is just operationally, you you your thesis and your talk advocated for like you pick a performance level and that tells you you know the, the size, uh, the, the truncation operator. But that's not really what you probably be able to do. Like you have a computer of fixed capacity, and then that tells you. Right. And so, so you have your computer of, of you know, whatever. Right. And so I, what I could not determine was how easy it was to invert sort of the, the truncation is for these resources. Can I tell what the performance about it? Yeah. So you can imagine, uh, I won't flip back to those slides, but uh, you can imagine that those bounds, I might have to you know, play with them a bit. So you, you can actually do that computationally, right? You can kind of brute force it. You can, yeah, OK. You can <laughs> it's like pick a value. It's like, no, pick no. a value and check it. Yeah. But, but the thing is, these bounds are like, you know, very, very straightforward to, to compute. So that would be like optimizing any old function in a computer. So you could do that. Okay. Now, for, I you suppose. But you don't the, actually have the inverse of the bound. For, for some of the bounds, I think you can get the inverse. Okay. Um, but I, that's not something that I've explored to any great okay. length. Yeah. And the reason why I did it in that sort of direction is because what people do in practice is they have to pick k. That's like the big problem, right? And so I thought, okay, let's motivate. How do we pick k? Well, we're going to instead pick a, a sort of level of error that we can handle. Maybe that's more intuitive to pick, and that tells you sort of what k you need to use. Any other questions? Uh, so maybe for, for the second part of your presentation, uh, for, I guess, your work, sort of you, you present everything in the sense that you have a bunch of clients or robots or whatever, and a server. Uh, does it need to be that you have like one central server, or can you distribute that, that yes. somehow? Yeah, so uh, I didn't say this, but there were actually two papers behind that contribution in the work. The first paper didn't have that central server. It actually had just a team of robots running around, and whenever they could talk to each other, they would. Um, it turns out, actually, in the, in the setting of Bayesian nonparametrics, where you have this extra ambiguity in the bottle size, that can be a huge problem when you stay in this decentralized framework, uh, simply because you can you can run into settings where there's just not enough agreement happening. Where you know one blob of robots over here are just developing their own model, and one blob of robots over here are developing a pretty much completely separate model. And when they come together, it's not like I have you know apples and oranges that I'm, I'm trying to match to apples and oranges. It's like apples and oranges, and I'm I'm trying to match to apple orange hybrids and apple orange hybrids. Like they're the same. They're the same latent traits, but they're represented differently. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that's just a consequence of the fact that we're using approximate inference, right? So if we settle in on one particular latent representation of our data, and, and someone else settles in on a different one, they're just doing local optimization, is the best they can hope for. When they come together to the match, there may not even be a common basis to match with, right? And that's, that's when it really doesn't work. And so for the Bayesian nonparametric work, I decided, OK, I'm going to simplify my life. I'm going to have a central server. Everything will still be asynchronous, but there is that one common point of failure in the vision of parametric case. I see. Um, OK, may maybe some sort of, is it possible to do some sort of tree structure? So that's exactly what we did. Uh, oh. that, that, that is the first thing we tried, and it failed pretty miserably, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I went back to the drawing board. And, that, and now, that being said, that failed miserably 
the, having that central server turned out to be, it, it just it solved that problem almost completely. So it's, it seems like the, having that central node, at least for the way that I've done it, is pretty critical. I imagine if you were clever and spent a while thinking about it, you might be able to come up with a better way of doing that. I see. Okay. Uh, and if you go back to slide 52. All right. Oh, I thought you were going to pull up my thesis and ask me to flip to a page. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh boy, I'm not going to do this. You said 52? Yes. Um, I asked about it before, but uh, I'm still puzzled. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Um, what, when you say CPU time, are, are we talking server time plus all the individual nodes? I, so what I'm talking about there is I have this data stream, I have my server, I have my nodes. Mm -hmm. I start the whole thing. So like, go. And all the nodes start trying to compute. They grab data. They're all arguing for things. They're all doing these matching problems. And the moment that stream runs out, stop. They, they're done. Yeah. So it's like you, it's basically so the that, time that, the user. That's user. Yeah, it's the, it's the user time. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So it's just like your, I guess, as a user, that amount of time that it would take you to get a result. Oh, so so more threads uh, actually means you know more computation overall. Uh, but the time perhaps is not accounted for. Like the maximum time across the threads. I yeah. see. Okay, so so if if you know you have one hundred threads uh, spending one second, you're going to say that was one second, not that. Okay, yeah, great. Exactly. Because otherwise, I was like, okay, how could you possibly have less time for, <laughs> yes. for more threads? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is okay. Overall. So so in that case, it seems that at some point it, it kind of taper, tapers yes. off, and you you don't actually get I'm glad, I'm glad any improvement it's beyond KQ, something. What's up? Isn't that KQ kicking in across multiple? No. Uh, so what that actually is is hyperthreading. Um, I told you we had a, we had a CPU. Oh, this is totally oh wait, oh, I told you we had a CPU with 24 threads. I plotted it up to 48 because there's hyperthreading, just to see what would happen. It turns out hyperthreading did not help us. That it just got bogged down. It's not meant for scientific computing, so that I mean that made perfect sense. But it was funny. I actually I was at a, I was at a NIPS at a poster when someone pointed this out to me. And I was just baffled. I was like, I don't know why that happened. That makes no sense. At least you didn't spend a lot of time modeling it. To yeah. 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 What I really should have done, honestly, what I really should have done, just cut the plot off at 24. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was interesting to say, OK, you know, hyperthreading doesn't really help us here. And, and they're the same mini batch sizes yeah. for all 24. Yes, exactly. OK. And, and on both sides of the graph, it's the same mini batch. So when it's one CPU, it's like if there's a server sending mini batch to one node that does its thing and sends it back up to the server. Yeah, yeah exactly. With and without trade matching. Yeah. So, okay, if you went up to 24, um, like okay, ideally you would get something like linear speed up. It yeah. seems that you're not quite getting linear. Like, like, um, any, any intuition about like, you know, what the bottleneck is or like what kinds of problems you can expect this to go further than, right. you know. So I always am very, very hesitant for reason about what CPUs do because uh, <laughs> if, I, if there's any CPU researchers in the audience here, they will just do uh, But they're very, very complicated devices. They don't do what you think they would. Um, I don't really want to put my you know, stake in the sand on why that didn't get linear up to 24. I mean, it's possible that just the, the memory bandwidth on the, like the North Bridge was essentially saturated with the seat. Like, who knows? I, I wish I could tell you, but I really, I don't want to go into that. That would be beyond my expertise. For sure. Were these actually 24 core machine, or these were six full core machines? It was a 24 core machine. So it was one machine, I believe it had three CPUs on a, on a motherboard that were each eight cores. And John's smiling at me because he said it was one of his machines. Yeah, I think it was one. Also, parallel processes. I have a uh, one small question. So when you're doing these mini batches, do they all have to be exactly the same mini batches for each of your robots, or could they? Because I mean, they're, obviously they're doing their computation in asynchronously, but can they? Are they retrieving from the stream asynchronously as well? Yeah, absolutely. They're they're doing everything asynchronously. Um, now that being said, you know you need some amount of synchronization so that robots aren't just like grabbing chunks of each other's data. This yeah. does rely on the dis disjointness of the data. So you're right. There is some. Minor amounts oh, of synchrony there. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I could have measured the time that would have taken. I don't think it would because okay. you're not doing it. There's no computation happening when you do that walk. You're literally just saying, guys, I, I 
grab them to data point 56 and find the yeah. MMU online. Did you say what the total data set size and mini batch size were here? Uh, as I, s I did not. Uh, I would have to go back. I think the data set size was in the range of about a million or like 10 million data points. And uh, uh, the mini batch size was 100 or 200 data points in that range. Okay. Yeah. I don't have exact. Oh, sure. That's fine. Trevor, on the, on the right, sure. threads is number of batches, correct? No, threads is number of like, uh, like computation threads. How many batches? Well, it was, I mean, roughly 1 to 10 million data points divided by the Oh, so even with one thread, you've got multiple batches. Yeah, you know what? That that might have actually been. So that's the difference. That might help explain what happened between those two. Yeah. Because it is doing, it's doing more work as well. The yeah. CPU time is higher. Because yeah. the, the performance is statistically that's, significantly different. The error bars don't overlap. That's exactly what So a single thread has to, without yes. create matching, has to match all of the data. Okay. Thank you for answering my question for me. That was uh, a great help. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah, batch goes down, goes back. Batch goes down, comes back. Yeah. So this is matched. this. Yeah, yeah right. I, I, I just you know, didn't That's throw right. this map, but this is like a streaming algorithm, like purely streaming. There's no distributedness going on, but this guy's still not solving trade matching problems. So after that first mini batch, it grabs it, says an order, we're great, and then it it does the next one and it goes, oh wait a second. Play a different order, or it, it, variational inference might have found a different order. I mean, in your thesis, t you should put, uh, just put the yeah, number of batches I, somewhere. Oh, uh, it's in the thesis. I just, yeah. I made a, a mistake and did not put that. I'm afraid you failed your thesis. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> any other questions from anybody? Um, if there's no other questions, then at this point, I'll ask the committee members and readers and any other faculty in the room to stay in and ask everyone else, um, including yourself, to step out. You don't get the chat? Here, I'll leave this up if you guys want to close That's the best part. How do I stop this? Just tell them it's over. It's <laughs> over, guys. Go home. Job's done. <laughs> Job's done. Grab some fruit. This stuff is oh, if you have people watching, we should also. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. Here, people just, live feed you. It's already yeah. stopped. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. No, oh, no, 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 no. Now, now you're going on to Twitch. So sorry. Okay. I like how everyone on the screen was probably just like, what? actually run the trade matching multiple times with different parameters, I suppose, but then you'd have to run mini matching. Yeah. Right, so there's, no, there's no parameters in the matching optimization itself. Like that's, that's, the parameters of that, I guess, are determined by the inference algorithm that you use. So, so if you wanted to do that, you could, absolutely. But you'd have to rerun the mini batch inference over and over and over again, and that would be slow. Why do you have to run the inference again? If you change the parameters, you have to you'd have to rerun the inference to, to figure out that new allocation of traits, right? Okay, so, so you have a very... Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's great. And yeah. then uh, you have your emerging process. Yeah, we're good. She takes yes. some traits and it says, oh, these traits are these traits. Yes, and exactly. Match them. And then uh, the part where it breaks down is when you get, like, politics one and politics two. Yeah, if, if, you, if you merge incorrectly, which can happen, but usually when that happens, it's not the main problem, but what, what, what typically will happen is you'll have politics um, with like, with like uh, a twinge of sports on okay, one, so like, like food politics, and like food politics on another, okay, and what will happen is you'll try to merge them, it'll be mostly politics, and they'll be like, no, those aren't the same, and I'll just keep them separate, and so you'll have okay, so politics ood and politics orts. Okay. 
And that's, I mean, that's not a problem of yeah, the, okay. my algorithm, yeah, that's the problem of the, the, the inference. Yeah. yeah. What if they stop writing about like politics and food and they only write about... Oh, so, it's, so like for, for, for algorithms and like truncate, mm -hmm. uh, like that shit. Yeah, it, it, it's a local problem. optimization. So it's just gonna, no, but you're, you're so like combined with everything. When they, when they, were, no, when they were talking about like no. being surprised, like I was surprised at the time, they were talking about like, like truncate out if, if you mess up your local inference, which I have no control over, that's my, my algorithm like assumes you're doing a good job of inference. No, but what if you can't forget about something? Like what if you just stop that? Oh, so what'll happen, so in these models, um, they're, first of all, the models that I'm dealing with aren't built for that, but what will happen is the weight on that trait will just slowly fall away over time. But pretty slowly. It'll go slow, yeah. It's not like, that model's not meant to handle But there are models that are there designed are. to deal with these things changing over time. Yeah. The fact that you don't expect your, you, the topic to be <laughs> So it's, it's funny because I, I know who that is. You can probably tell like when when I was like giving the talk versus the when I was answering just questions, just like. Yeah. Once it starts, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was kind of funny though. I, I completely blanked on that. So that was something that somebody brought up at lips that that's like discrepancy. And at the time, I was like, oh, that's what it is. But like standing in front of a crowd, like ah, I'm blanking. But you're very chill about it. You're like, I get that. Sorry. I mean, one of the things they teach you throughout the PhD is like when you don't know something, just say you don't know. That's all you can do. Yeah. Oh, it's it's cool. better than like, yeah. or, 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 and then or you can do like this guy next. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you do. I'm like, I don't know what this guy does. It's like, Julian did that, right? <laughs> yeah. I see Ashley coming. Julian, sorry. Yeah, so the question about like the descriptive bars and like what they represent, um, you call it user time? Yes. Just it's one o'clock time. Yeah. Yeah. I saw you. I saw you say that. I was like, ah, I should have said one o'clock time. But because it's like completely divorced from the processing system, and it's like the actual time. That yeah. That's how you. Oh, it's just so like so, so there, yeah. So like, yeah. It's like if you were sitting at your computer and you look like, at the clock like that. You like quantify how long you've done it. Wait. My RTC is accurate. Yeah. 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 It can be more or less, right? Because like your CPU might be doing other things. Too, right? so you can play billing of like yeah. Dota 2 at the same time. If, so if, I, had, <laughs> if I had like 120 CPUs and each runs for one second, yeah. my algorithm would have 120 seconds. Right. Uh, but and, that, and then there's like, there's like, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, system time, which is like the system itself keeps up the clock, but like you can have things that interrupt it. Yeah, that's, that's a good type of question. Yeah, He's actually the one that I'm working on. Yeah. 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 
That's why I said I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 she used the most interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you right now. The, yes, the, the, the number of like, incredibly important people in the world is fast. So like, the worst thing is when people start she's at like, like, first moment, you guys start entering. Yeah, yeah, like, 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 I had like, 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 just a chance to get all over. I had John Gilly. There was someone else in there, but these are like, like, you like, the most intelligent people I know. And I'm just like, ah. Got no. I've been in like. High memory. It's, it's also like you need like a CPU to. So it has to be a general process. You really? Yeah. You need like a GPU. Yeah. 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 Just like it's not kind of doing any one particular complicated operation. It's not doing a lot of very diverse, like a huge variety of operations. Really? So that's surprising to me because like like GPUs nowadays are fine. They might be now. Like the last time, like when I looked at doing something like this on GPUs. It, like, I, I actually talked to Julian who was like, it's just really weird. I was like, I'll take it. Like, so, if it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it is definitely memory related. Uh, it does the size of the mini batch is the problem. Yeah, the size. There's also like it depends on what model you use because some models have more parameters than others. You need like one parameter for every single data point in some models. It's almost more parameters. It, you know, I bet I bet you could do it on GPU. At face value, I don't know whether you'd get any real gains off of it. So, so the other question is like, a lot of your, everything you're doing right now, do you like work single place or single node on your buildings, right? Uh, what do you mean by that? Like you said, you guys tried to treat things as if it works. Yes, okay, fine. Yeah, single or uh, central. Well, I mean, so the problem is, like, if you have, like, 50 computers, you have to run communication with every single step, right? Not necessarily. So the, the, the nice thing, so in that first paper that I mentioned, with finite models, because you have that, like, known finite model size, you're more likely to discover the same set of traits in your data. Yeah. And if you, as long as you do that, you can actually do peer to peer. Like you don't have to do this dense communication at the ground. You can actually legitimately have a robot like driving around, and it sees another robot and go, "Hey, bro, this yeah. is what I learned." Yeah. Yeah. And you can uh, also uh, scale to many batches to reduce the uh, communication. There is a I mean, you have to, as like the system designer, you have to pick like how much data am I going to like try to chunk at once? Yeah. And actually, it doesn't need to be the same size every time. And, yeah. so, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The only thing that you need is that the mini batches are distinct. So you can't like touch the same data by two computers. I guess you, can, I guess you don't want to double count information. Yeah. So what you're doing is trade matching. The trade matching is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, so you can have like. 
two data sets that are distinct, but like you can imagine like one cluster got split in half by one data set and by another. And so ideally, the two nodes would each learn about that cluster. They'd be a little different, but they'd be close. And then when you do that matching, they actually get smashed together into one. So, I mean, go ahead. No, I, I actually already forgot what I was going to say. Go for it. Yeah, do you know what? So, I mean, like, it sounds, it sounds, like, it sounds, like, it sounds like meshing a like, coding over, like, a Oh, really? Oh. Did you guys turn it back on? I don't think so. Hi, guys. Apparently, we're still back on. I'm going to turn you off now. <laughs> so, I looked, and it said that Bitstream was still on. So like if you reception and Oh my god, god.